Now we're continuing part three of this series on rebuilding community, rebuilding the identity of the church, which coincides with our 2020 stewardship commitment campaign. And our focus is on both halves of that statement, the importance of understanding what it means to be the church, part of the people of God, the body of Christ, and the importance of our commitment to stewardship, including our financial stewardship as a corporate body. To that end, we've asked that you pray and ask God what he wants you to give in 2020 for the church's operational budget and to indicate that to us by filling out a stewardship commitment card and returning that to the church. Excuse me. If you haven't yet made your commitment, but you plan to do so, you're, you're welcome to turn that in at any time. And if you're still waiting to hear from God, we completely understand that. We're not going to pressure you. We're not going to pester you. And if you're not sure you want to make a commitment at this time, we understand that as well. Because it's very important for each of you to settle in your own heart whether you want to follow Jesus with us and to be identified with this church before you make that kind of a commitment. That's just reasonable. That's understandable. To be sure that you want to be identified with this church and, and that's something that only you can determine before God. But for all of us here, our fundamental stance is taken from what the scripture says, which is that each person needs to be convinced in his or own, her own heart what to give. So you can give cheerfully and not under compulsion, not because you've been manipulated by someone somehow. Everything we have belongs to God and he's the only one who has the right to direct us to say, this is how much you're supposed to give. This is where you're supposed to give it. This is when you're supposed to give it. So we encourage you to, to ask God and expect him to lead you. And we trust you for that. So let's look now at these, these two examples of closings from Paul's letters. And I, I apologize. I don't have any slides for you today. Uh, you're just going to have to look at my, my kisser here. So I do apologize for that. But as always, it's a little helpful to, to know something of the background information that can shed light on what it is we're reading. And one of the most important bits of background information on these two letters has to do with the recipients. The church is in Colossae and, and in Rome. In each case, Paul is writing a letter to a church he did not found and which he had never visited at the time of writing the letter. He had never been to either of these two places, either of these two churches, before he wrote to them. All of his information about those churches had come from people Paul knew or from people who had come to him from those churches. And that little bit of information ought to cause us to sit up and pay attention when we read these closing sections. In Paul's letter to the Colossian church, there are a number of people who are with him who are sending their greetings back to the church, including one Epaphras, who was likely the person who founded the church after he had been discipled by Paul during Paul's time in Ephesus. And in addition, Paul sends his personal greetings to one woman, Nympha, who hosts a church that meets in her home. In Paul's letter to the Romans, which was a few years earlier, he sends greetings to 28 different individuals, some of whom he knows quite well, such as Prisca and Aquila and Eponidas, others whom he likely knows only by reputation. He also greets several families and different house churches. The group of names includes both men and women, includes Jews and Gentiles, and some of those Gentiles have Latin names and others have Greek names, indicating that they had different ethnicities. These shared greetings and the fact that Paul can name so many specific individuals points to a very significant feature of the early church, which is that they were connected to one another in very deep and meaningful ways, despite being separated by distance, by culture, by ethnicity, and by status. Their relational connection to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ superseded the normal cultural or familial relationships that characterized the rest of society. It was more important to know them than to be identified with where you were from or who you were related to. The Christians acknowledged one another, that they recognized one another, that they belonged together because they belonged to Jesus Christ in whom they had been reconciled to God and to one another. Slaves and slave owners met as equals in Christ in the church. Former enemies found common ground as fellow servants of God. The wealthy and the poor, 
whose lives otherwise would never have intersected shared a table and shared a faith that brought them together in relationships as family. I want to note a second significant feature of the early church that shows up in these two letters. The churches met in private homes rather than in large public buildings. Now, usually this would have meant that someone who was wealthy, who had a home large enough to host a sizable group, would have been the patron for the church. And the churches could even be identified by the patron. So we have the notation of the church that meets in so-and-so's house. In Colossians, Paul mentions the church that meets in Nympha's house. In Romans, he mentions at least three different groups, excuse me, possibly as many as five different groups that belong to different house churches there in Rome. So these house churches were smaller groupings of the larger unit, which was the church in the city or the church in the region. So Paul can write a letter to the church in Colossae or to the church in Rome. That would include all of the Christians in that given locale, the general location, such as the city or maybe even the region. Even though rarely, if ever, would all of those Christians meet in the same place at the same time. And he can distinguish then smaller groupings, the various house churches that made up of believers who regularly would meet together in the home of one of their group. Now, there's a number of interesting implications of that feature from the early church, but there's two that I want to mention today. First of all, this sense of belonging together, which I, I just referred to a moment ago, was more than simply sharing a common location. The Christians in a particular city or in a particular region were connected by these intimate relationships that had been fostered through their involvement in small groups where they regularly met for mutual encouragement, for worship, for instruction. But second, they recognized that this common faith that connected them with others connected them with those who were outside of their small house church, their small group. They belonged to this larger family that could be identified by the wider location, the city in which they lived, even though it was a large city. They belonged to that family precisely because they shared a common set of beliefs, a faith that was not peculiar to one single individual or to their small group, but something that breached the ordinary dividing lines of their society. Now, there's a third feature that's important to note. It's found in the chapter in Romans in particular. Paul warns the church in Rome about the dangers of potential divisions that are due to the fact that there are some who appear to be a part of the church, he says, but they're actually not servants of Christ because they oppose the teaching that has been passed down by Paul and the other apostles. And these deceivers, Paul calls them, he says they endanger the church's unity and the church's faith because that unity and that faith is not founded on warm feelings or wonderful times of feasting together. It's founded on a shared experience of receiving the Spirit of God as a result of repenting, confessing Jesus as Messiah and Lord and being water baptized, and a shared commitment to live according to the word of Jesus as taught by the apostles and by those others who transmitted the master's teachings. So as I've said in the past two weeks, this means that it was possible to identify those who were a part of the group, who, to identify those who were a part of the church and those who were not. There were lines that were drawn, walls if you will, that could identify who was in the church and how you could determine that status. Now, the early churches were not organized in the same way as churches are today, but there was a formal, public way to personally identify as a follower of Christ, and that was through water baptism. And that remains true to this day. Being baptized in water was the way to signal that you recognized Jesus as Messiah, as Savior, as Lord, and you had surrendered your life to Him, and now you wanted to be known publicly as belonging to Him and to His people, the church. So the initial step of identification with Jesus was the declaration of your faith through water baptism, and all of those who were baptized were recognized as members of the church, part of the body of Christ. But then there was another aspect of identification with the church, and that was continuing to follow Jesus. 
the fact that Paul and the other authors of the New Testament, without exception, they can identify individuals who are falsely representing themselves as part of the church, even though they've abandoned the teaching of Jesus and the apostles. And that means that the authors of the New Testament, the apostles and those who were in leadership in the, in the early church, recognized that there were some who had been baptized and therefore had initially identified with Jesus, but they had since departed from the faith and therefore were no longer part of us. John can even say they went out from us, and some of them were never actually a part of us even though they looked like they were part of us. So the early churches were united by their common faith. They were connected together by their relationships that had been forged in these common experiences of worship and instruction and fellowship. And they were tied together by their commitment to continue to follow Jesus together. And so because this was true, because they were connected spiritually in this way as the followers of Christ, as the members of his body, Paul calls them to put into practice that which had been commanded by Jesus, to love one another. And he says, love is the mark of a disciple of Jesus. That's still the case. Paul says, this is what binds us together. This is what brings unity among people who aren't naturally drawn together. As we submit to the teachings of Jesus, as we determine to really follow what he instructed his disciples to do, God builds something that is visible. He builds something that the world can see that shows what it looks like to be a part of the kingdom of God. When we live as Jesus taught, we are living out what it looks like to be a part of the kingdom of God, to live as what we were always intended to look like, to live under God's direct rule. And that spiritual unity lived out in very practical and visible ways is the real sign of membership in the body of Christ. Now, those early churches were small. Um, so there wasn't really any need for an additional level of organization. Every believer knew who was a part of their house church. You knew everybody in the house church. If somebody new came in, they joined it, you knew that as well. And local leaders could point out who else was a follower of Christ in the other house churches that were nearby. And the occasional letter or visit from an apostle or another of the, the leaders at that time could let you know about other churches that were elsewhere. But two millennia of church history later, we have a different situation. Okay? It's still true that Jesus invites people to follow him. Aren't you glad for that? Right? You, okay. Made me nervous there for a moment. <clears throat> still true that Jesus invites people to follow him. <clears throat> when we do, when we repent of our sins, when we confess our faith in him, the Bible says we're born again. and We become part of the invisible church, part of all of those who belong to Jesus Christ by virtue of our faith, a church that exists globally, and you can't, you can't mark its borders, okay? Because only God knows the hearts, only God knows who all that is. And following through with water baptism then signals our public identification with Jesus. And he, Jesus still calls us then to unite with a portion of his body, a local church community who are tied together by this common faith, our connection relationally, and that we're committed to following Jesus together as the visible church. So in one very real and very important sense, you cannot join the church of the followers of Jesus Christ. That is, you cannot join this invisible church other than by come, becoming born again. That makes you a part of the invisible church because you're a part of God's body. There's no card you sign, there's no ceremony you go through to become a part of the invisible church other than your repentance and confession of faith in Jesus and then following through with water baptism to let that be known publicly. If you've sincerely, honestly surrendered your life to Jesus, if you've asked him to forgive you, if you've pledged your allegiance to him, then he says that you belong to him and nobody else can say differently. But belonging to the visible church is another matter. In most cases, it's different because, uh, because we have 2,000 years of church history and things have happened. That's the, that's the short version. At, <laughs> uh, at first, Chris, I've got a whole semester course. I teach two semesters, actually. We can get the rest of the details if you like. 
But there's another formal step for us at First Christian, and in, as in most cases, for those who want to identify with us to commit to following Jesus together with us. Okay, and that step is formal membership. Now, let me be very quick to say that as a church community, we always want to follow the example of Jesus when it comes to talking about what it means to identify with this particular body of believers. So, for instance, we don't say that we're the only body of Christ, we're the only church, we're the true church, we're the real church. We don't say any of those things. We say we're a part of the body of Christ, we're very happy to be this part, right? <clears throat> but also it means that, for instance, Jesus welcomed anyone who was seeking to know more. Anyone who wanted to hear what he had to say or even was just curious about him was welcome to come and listen. He made no demands of those who just wanted to come and listen. They were even invited to continue to follow him for as long as they liked. And he made the same offer to everyone, the same offer to hear the gospel, the same opportunity to learn about the kingdom of God, the same opportunity to recognize their need for God's salvation, their opportunity to repent, to acknowledge him as Lord and Savior, to become one of his followers. Anyone was welcome to become one of his followers. Now, it is not true that he treated everyone the same, by the way. There were some had, who had different requirements if they were going to continue to follow. For instance, there was one young man, and Jesus says, you've got to sell everything you, got, you own. But he didn't say that to absolutely everybody. But for him, it was a requirement. So Jesus welcomed everyone without a requirement. But then he did insist to be his disciple, to become part of his people. There was, in fact, a definite requirement, and that was quite costly. Everyone had to surrender to him. Everyone had to forsake his or her own way. Everyone had to die to ruling over your, your own life and take up the cross and follow. One of the biggest fallacies that has taken root, and it's a deep root in the Western church, particularly in the United States, is this idea that you or I can follow Jesus on our own terms. And that is an unbiblical, uh, it's an unbiblical lie. It's, a, it's not biblical. It's untrue. This idea that I can follow Jesus however I feel like it, on my terms, how I want to do it, has no basis in Scripture, and it's as about as far from the truth as it's possible to be. I, I make up my own ideas about God. I have my own, own notions of what it means to, quote, be a Christian, my own rules for living. Uh, that is not to be a follower of Jesus. Let me give you a couple of imaginary situations to illustrate the point, okay? Suppose you own a business. You're looking to hire someone to work for you. <clears throat> a man comes in to apply for the position, and he says, hey, I'm really interested in this job. I would love to work here. Now, you should understand that I, I really need to be free to do what I like, so I'll show up most Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and, and I'll, by the way, I'll occasionally work for the competition across town because that owner is really a cool guy. And, and I need to be able to follow my own path for getting things done on my own timetable because I don't do real well with pressure and rules. Oh, and by the way, I think you, ought, you, ought to, you really ought to rewrite some of your company policies because they are really outdated. I have some ideas I'd, I'd love to share with you. Would any one of you hire that person? Of course not. You'd be an idiot if you would hire that person. Or suppose there's a young man. He's just proposed to his girlfriend. And he is eagerly waiting for her reply. He's down on one knee. He's offered the ring. She looks at the ring. She takes it and she says, oh, this is nice, thanks. Sure, I'll marry you. Oh, but I do have a couple of other boyfriends in other cities. And I'm going to keep seeing them too because I love them too. But whenever I'm here, we can definitely live together and stuff. Oh, and if we're going to be married, I mean, I'm going to need you to support them while they're getting their careers off the ground, so our budget needs to allow for giving to them so they can pursue their dreams. Would you counsel that boy to marry that gold digger? Of course not! You'd be a fool to do so. Now, formal church membership is not the same as marriage or being employed by someone. It's, it's easier to get in and easier to get out. But those relationships are examples of a kind of exclusive relationship that is designed for mutual benefit. But the benefit is only available because of the fact that it's exclusive. 
there's something of great value that comes from being employed, and it's more than the paycheck. There's something of great value that comes from being married that's different from simply living together or sleeping around. And there's something of great value that comes from publicly identifying with a local church that's greater than simply attending. Now, I'm the first to admit, I, I have difficulty quantifying what that value is. I just know that there's something that happens inside of you when you commit to another person, when you commit to a group of people, something of spiritual weightiness takes root in your soul as Jesus begins to work in you to build his kingdom in you. Because formal membership is not an empty thing. If nothing else, formal membership is a great reminder that we are not given the option of following Jesus on our own terms, or really on our own at all. He, he never makes that opportunity to us. Now, you should have been given a piece of paper when you came in today that's titled, affirmation of membership. It looks like this. If you didn't receive one, would you hold up your hands and, and uh, the guys in the back will uh, bring that to you. If you have it, would you take that out, please? We've got someone up front here that needs one. Some of the worship team probably didn't get one. Uh, Mary didn't get one. Every adult needs to have one. Don't try to share with your spouse. Because guess what? You, you can't come into the kingdom of God because your spouse is a believer. Not, you don't, there's no coattails. Okay. Every adult needs to have one of these. All right. We're going we're, we're gonna to do something today together, and please allow me to explain. We've been talking about rebuilding the identity of the church, and I've been emphasizing the importance of um, understanding that we're called to follow Christ together. Our identity is based on that commitment, just as, as your identity in marriage is based on your commitment to that person. And, and our identity, both personally and corporately, as followers of Jesus Christ, is involved in this commitment. So we recognize a few basic things that this commitment entails. First of all, we recognize that the fundamental reality of being a follower of Jesus Christ requires more than simply acknowledging that there's a God up there somewhere, or that it's important to sincerely believe something, or that it's, great to be, it's important to be a moral person. Being a follower of Jesus Christ begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, personally responding to his invitation to come into the kingdom by repentance from sin, which essentially is living your own way in charge of your life, you being deciding what's right or wrong or good or true and uh, living by your own authority, Re forsaking that and surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. When we surrender, the Bible says we're born again, the Spirit of God comes to live inside of us, makes us righteous before God and cleanses us from our sins, takes away our guilt and our shame and gives us spiritual life. We then follow that up publicly by identifying with Jesus through water baptism. So salvation comes by faith. Water baptism then signals that I'm publicly identifying with Jesus and with his people. Secondly then, so that's the fundamental reality. That's how, that's how you become a Christian. Secondly, then there's a common faith that serves as a doctrinal basis for our identity as a group of followers of Christ, a statement of our faith which contains the essential beliefs that we share, which we hold in common with the historic church throughout the world and throughout the ages. And, uh, our statement of faith in, at First Christian is a summary of some of these essential truths that the Christian church holds and has held throughout the ages. Thirdly, we recognize that our commitment is not simply to ideals or to ideas, but to specific people, to other people who are a part of this local church. We are this church. It's not just a group of random people who happen to occupy a space for a certain time and a certain day. We are committed to following Christ together for as long as Jesus sees fit to assign us to this place. And fourth, then, we recognize that our commitment requires not only our participation in the events and activities of the church, but our personal and financial support of one another and the ministries and the missions of Jesus that are specific to this congregation. So today, we are inviting everyone who would like to identify with First Christian Church, who would like to be known as a part of this congregation, to sign this affirmation of membership and submit it to the leadership of the church as an indication that it is your intention to either affirm 
or reaffirm your formal and public identification with First Christian as a member of the church. Now, why are we doing this? Well, in part, just pragmatically, we're trying to clear up any confusion about what it means to be a member here and who's a member and so on. And, and there has been a little bit of, of uncertainty about that. For longtime members, and I know some of you have been members, formal members of this church for longer than I've been alive. But for you, why would we ask you to reaffirm this? <clears throat> it's a chance for you to say, not only do I have a history with this church, a past, but I'm part of its present, and hopefully I'm a part of its future. I'm committed to being a part of what God is doing in this place, not just to showing up on Sunday occasionally. And for, if you're new here, or maybe you've been attending here for some time, but you've never formalized your membership, it's a chance for you to say, I'm committing to do more than just attend, to more than just being involved, sort of. I'm, I'm not only going to be an active participant in the life of this church, I'm going to identify with you. I'll be called by your name. I'll add my name to the list of those who can be called upon to share in the burden of responsibility for whatever it is that happens here. For those of you who are visiting with us today, you may have been coming for a few times. This may be your first time ever. And you thought, really? I get hit with this the first time. <clears throat> well, it might be easy for you to be swept up by emotion or by a sense that the Spirit has led you here and you want to belong to this family. Never been anywhere quite like this. Well, that might be what God's saying to you. <clears throat> Perhaps this ought to be your church home. If so, we'd be delighted. But I want to encourage you not to sign the affirmation just yet. I think it's important to date before you get married. I really do. I think it's important to know who you're committing to support and love and work with and live with and who you're committing to partner with. And that takes some time. That takes intentionality. And that takes some thought and prayer and some question and answer and some seeking the Lord together. So go ahead and hold on to the paper. This will not be your last opportunity to sign it. That's true of anyone, by the way. But we would, we'd love to discuss it with you further. We'd love to, well, sometime after our dinner at least, we'd like to, which we hope you'll stay for if you're visiting, we'd like to discuss it with you. And, and if you're here and, and you're unsure, I'm not sure I'm ready to commit to being a member of the church, or I, I know that I'm not ready, or maybe I'm not even interested in becoming a member at all. Just understand, that's okay. We, you don't have to leave. You don't have to quit coming. <laughs> We're not interested in trying to twist anyone's arm, coerce anyone to join the church. Uh, this isn't the last chance to do this. God could lead you later if to, to seek membership. If, if you're not sure it's from God, well, then let's just keep waiting until you are sure. And even then, if, if it says, I don't think I'm supposed to be a member, you're still welcome. We're committed to doing our best to make sure that everyone, member, or not, is treated as a part of our family, and that includes visitors, it includes seekers, it includes skeptics, even KU students who are here on an assignment from their class to explore a religious community, because there are some of those things that happen out there. And, and for all of us, whether you're ready to sign the commitment or not, it is a reminder that we're not called to simply be consumers of religious services. We're called to be active followers of Jesus Christ to live for him as he directs, to grow more like him as we learn to live according to his word. So here's what I'm asking you to do. <clears throat> to take this paper, for everyone who wishes to become a member or who wants to reaffirm their membership today, we put the statement of faith at the top because you should agree with that. If you don't agree with that, let's talk about it because that might signal something. And, and if you have questions about it, that's perfectly legitimate. Um, there are some places in here where I'd say, you know what, I'd reword that a little bit differently, but I'm okay with it as it stands. <clears throat> so we start with that, because the doctrinal basis for our unity is not the only basis, but it is one of those walls. And secondly, we're saying then sort of an ABC after that fundamental agreement. We're acknowledging that you, in fact, 
have come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. You have repented of your sins. You have confessed him as Savior and Lord. You have asked him into your life. You've received him as Lord and Savior by faith. And secondly, the B, that's A, acknowledgement, B, baptized in water, that as a consequence of salvation, you, you've been baptized in water, or if you haven't, you're ready to be so, we can arrange that uh, in the near future. And thirdly, then, C, to commitment to participate and support the mission and ministries of this church. You're saying, I want to be identified an active participant of this church. This will be my church home until God releases me and sends me somewhere else. In which case, we would say, we want to pray for you and bless you and let you go there. So, we're going to pray. I'm going to, I'm going to invite you to sign it. And then, in, right after the close of our service today, we're going to have a, a brief... Uh, break to use the restroom or get a drink or stretch your legs or talk to someone or come up and ask a question, get prayer. And at 11.15, we're going to reconvene here for the annual meeting, right here. And you'll bring your signed affirmation of membership and exchange that for the uh, ballots that we'll be voting on at our annual meeting. You don't have to be a member to attend the annual meeting. You don't have to be a member to be an active participant in our church. You do have to be a member to vote. That's, that's one of the two privileges that is extended to members here. And the other is to serve on certain, uh, certain boards. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to pray. And then I'm going to invite you to sign it if you're ready. And if not, just hold on to it. And then uh, bring it back to the annual meeting. Uh, and if you're not going to attend the meeting for some reason you can sign it and turn it into one of the guys in the back or to mail it to the church. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the awesome gift of other people who are a help to us even when we don't always see it. But you've given us the gifts of other people to walk with as we walk this path, this journey of following Jesus Christ. People who can help us be models, examples, who can assist us, teach us, instruct us, encourage us, correct us, who can uh, show us a better way, who can accompany us so we're not alone. Thank you for the body of Christ. And as one part of your body, as this expression of the body of Christ, we thank you for the history, those who have gone before, who have sacrificed, who have given, who have worked, who have served, who have bled and died in this, as part of this church. We thank you for them. We thank you for those who are here now, who are being brought in, those who are yet to come in. We pray that you would help us to fulfill your purpose for this church body, for this place. We are the people of God. We're not all the people of God, but we're the people of God in this place. And so I pray for your help, for everyone who's here, that they could hear clearly from you whether or not you've asked them to say yes to formal membership at First Christian. That you'd be very clear with them if that's what you want from them. And if that isn't what you want from them, that you'd be clear as well. And that they could feel the peace of God. As Paul said, to let the peace of God rule in this place. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask you now to speak to us and encourage us, show us what it is you want from us. For it is in your name that we pray. Amen.